welcome to Philosophy, the podcast where I talk about whatever I like. Uh, in today's episode, I am going to continue with the midtones. I think we're still stuck at the midtones here. Oops, you probably can't say a lot. So um, I think we're still doing the midtones. And um, I think I'm also potentially going to get started on the highlights. I The way that I like to do this, if I can just go into it for a second, is that um, what I like about small paintings is that I can everything is very uniform. So I can apply all the darkness everywhere it needs to be and all the midtones everywhere it needs to be and all the light tones everywhere it needs to be without having to re-prepare the colours again and again, um, which I tend to do if I'm doing something in a longer time and then the paint dries or if it's too big and then I prepare too little paint and I need to do it again. So it tends to be quite patchy. While when it's done like this, it all tends to be uniform. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm working on at the moment. I think that she has this gorgeous little highlight here that I really want to capture in the end, um, which you tend to get with like round objects. So especially on the bottom of her chin, she probably has reflection from her lower body. Um, so that needs to be a bit lighter. And then once it's all done and I can see all the colours where they are, I'll go into more detail with setting kind of some of the darker tones because at the moment it's very uniform. Um, so there's little detail in the darker bits. But um, once I set the light tones, the the mid-tones, then I can add even darker bits and even lighter bits, if that makes sense. Anyway, um, now that there was this rambly little bit out of the way, um, I want to, let's get, yeah, let's, let's, let's chat about the topic today, um, which is on kind of, I guess, what to do with our lives is the general theme here. Um, but the, that's too big. I'm not going to approach that all in, in I'm not going to be approaching that whole thing, but that's kind of the um the general theme of what we're talking about. In general, the reason this came about is because I read um the book Twelve and a Half, I think it was called. Um and it was a kind of a marketing business book, nothing too interesting, nothing too groundbreaking, but there was one thing in it that really, really kind of struck me hard and had me um thinking for quite a bit. And it was the advice that um, you should never apply for a job where your performance is evaluated based on the thing that you are the worst at. So if your weakest point tends to be one of the things that you are evaluated in in your job, you're in the wrong job. You're not going to be great at that. And I was like, oh my God, this is crazy because it kind of goes against that conventional advice of like improve on your weaknesses because that's exactly what the guy was saying was if you want to excel and if you want to be, uh, you know, excellent and I, there's proof that excellence is tied to happiness. So if you want to be happy, which I'm much more interested in than being excellent, um, you should not try to improve on your weaknesses. You don't care about the weaknesses because um, especially if you are at a huge disadvantage in your weaknesses, doing a whole lot of work will get you to be average or mediocre at best. While if you can try to improve and grow on your strengths, you have so much more opportunity to become one of the best at those things. So why the hell are you trying to improve on your weaknesses? Let those be and focus on your strengths. Now, I'm going to delve into this in various different ways, but the first thing that came to mind was, of course not. Um, no, that's just not true. I think um, that's the thing that I felt because, for example, let's. And, uh, it's so interesting, right? Because I feel like this has been my instinct when I was younger, but I always overrode it. So let's say, for example, we choose biology. And when I was in school, I always used to find it so much easier. And whenever I wanted to do revision, I wanted to do revision always on the topics that I was best. I feel like everyone does this, right? Like you don't want to revise the topics that you hate or the topics that you are the worst at because it's just not fun. Um, so every time that I would start my revision, what I wanted to do is just go through the topics that I like, do some difficult exercises in those, have a great time, get tired, stop, wrap the subject up and leave. And then I would have huge, you know, parts of the subject that I would just never know. And then I would get really frustrated and angry because I had my exam and I knew I had to improve on those. So it got to the point where I was kind of in high school that I would force myself to do the parts that I didn't know first. And it was painful. It was awful. It was just so, so, so annoying, but I just had to do it. I was like, oh, we're not going to focus on this part because this is not going to bring my grade down. And it's a good strategy for studying for school. I still stick to it because, you know, the thing that you're excellent at, um, you know, you might or may not get a question and you're already at a 10 out of 10 in that subject. There is no point in, you know, exploring it more and refining it and learning more about it, which should not be true, but unfortunately is true because of the way that we are graded in school. But what you should focus on are the things that you know nothing about, because if you get that question in an exam, you're going to absolutely fail and it will really bring your grade down. So bring up 
your worst points was the strategy in school. And I think I just adapted this for life. Now, having said that right now, as I'm saying this, I just feel so frustrated because I think the schooling system is not okay. We should not be encouraging students to be average. And there should be, if someone is genuinely crazy about something in a subject, and I was genuinely crazy about so many things in biology, especially, um, they should be encouraged to deep dive on those. And we should award grades like part of a grade for a student for being super excellent at something while they don't without their grade being brought down because they don't know something at all and something else if that makes sense there should be that opportunity surely like if I just care about one aspect of chemistry let me deep dive into that give me a super hard question let me go above and beyond in the exam and let me just not focus on some part of chemistry where I couldn't care less and I'm like I don't care about this and I wish I could still pass or still have a great grade despite that Anyways, moving on, I feel like slowly I'm building this version of Elizabeth School where, um, you know, we teach children about what happy families look like and what self-respect is and also where they have these really random exams. Um, But yeah, that's kind of my dream school in my mind, I guess. Anyways, back to baseline. Um, So I kind of took that behaviour into life and well, I mean, I'm still not out of school because I'm technically still in university. So I still need to apply the same logic to my exams. When I study for my exams, I have to do the same thing. When I study for my OSCEs in practice, I want to practice on the exams that I know the worst for patients. Because if that comes up in my exam, I am completely screwed. Well, if I miss one of like the 12 steps in a cardiovascular exam, but I know the rest of the 11, it's fine. It doesn't really matter. It's not, it doesn't have as bad consequences. But I guess when it comes to excellence in business and when it comes to excellence in careers and when it comes to excellence in other things in life, this advice apparently doesn't apply because being generally average is not the thing that I guess will help you stand out. Um, And when it comes to jobs, most things scraping by is enough and being excellent in one or two things will make you stand out so much more than basically scraping by in everything or being general or average in everything. And this was just such a huge mindset shift for me. Um, And I guess at, at the core, I think it brought up a lot of concern, I guess, for my future career and for the direction that I'm going in. Because if I take this to be true, and if I say that I don't want to be have a job where the core things that I'm evaluated on are things that I'm just awful at. And I definitely did this when I was a personal assistant. I am so chaotic. I'm so disorganized. <laughs> Being disorganized is one of my core virtues, my core values. And it's, I can be organized if I want to, but it just takes me so much more energy than the average person. And it takes me so much more work to even function at a basic level at doing this. And of course, when I take a job, I'm going to hide that from my employer and I'm just going to do 10 times more work in the background, um, work way too long on it and not say that I'm working so long to get this job because you need the money and you're a student. So obviously that happened. But in life, like now at this point, for example, I would never go for a PA job. Why would I go for a job where I am going to, um, I mean, unless I needed it, in which case, obviously I would do it again. Like I'm, I'm not saying that it's a bad job. It was actually genuinely so much fun. And there are so many benefits and I might do a whole deep dive onto why it's such a good idea to be a PA for someone. And if I respected someone and they offered me to be their PA, a hundred percent, I would do it again and again and again. It's the best job ever to get insights into someone's life and the way that things work. And you can learn more than anything else. But in terms of if I had any sort of self-esteem or self-respect or how I do a job, a PA is not a job for me because I am being evaluated on my weakest points in life. So now that I have that baseline out of the way, I started thinking, well, you know, let's think about um, Elizabeth and let's think about what are the things that she is good at and what are the things that she is bad at and how do these weigh up against my kind of the jobs that I want in life. And I would kind of recommend that you do the same thing. (laughs) So I want to go through a few things for me, but if you did the same thing for yourself and you kind of created a list of what are the characteristics that you are very weak in and what are the characteristics that you are potentially very strong in, um, and then we can see what these look like. So for example, I know that I am highly disorganized. I'm a very chaotic person. Um, I thrive in chaos, which is a good thing, but it's also a negative thing because I tend to create chaos around me. I never know what day of the week it is. I never know kind of what time it is. Sometimes I forget what month it is. I have no deadlines. I'm really bad with sticking to deadlines and remembering where they are. Um, I almost never am on time anywhere. Um, I just, I really struggle with numbers. 
it's really difficult for me to remember numbers or words sometimes, or new words are very hard for me to learn. Um, also, I really struggle with names, people's names. I might know someone for months or years sometimes, and I don't know their name. I, I, I recognize their name, so if someone would say the name. I'd know who they're talking about, but I don't. I can't connect the name to the face, and I can't find the name when I need to talk about them. Um, I don't know if anyone else has this because I've been thinking about it so much and you know I've been looking up different forms of amnesia I'm sorry I'm going on a tangent but I've been looking up forms of amnesia and I'm like what do I have what is this thing because I remember when I was younger in school for example I would be the end of the school year and there was only like 12 people in my class and I would still know the names of only three people would be the names I could come up with maybe the person I was sitting next to and my two best friends or something like that but the rest of the people in the class I'd be like um the person who sits next to this person or the person in the third row on the left um and it's not and honestly i would i hate it because the assumption is that you don't care enough about people or that you're just so rude and you're so self-absorbed that um you know you just never took the time to learn someone's name and i wish that were the case um and honestly it might be oh, god knows but i don't think it's the case i don't i make it i make a genuine effort and sometimes it's completely out of proportion like if you spend eight months with this person surely you would know their name not for me. This doesn't work. Sorry, random tangent, but just to make the emphasize the point of me learning words and names and numbers, so difficult. That's why like in medicine, I put in so much work to memorize um, like quantities of drugs or drug names. I can't even explain the amount of work that I need to do um, to memorize these things because it's really hard. Like I find it very, very easy to memorize kind of the pathways and the logics of how the logic behind how things work and kind of the connections and the systems between them I find it very easy to visualize these things um, and to understand them but the names oh my god <laughs> impossible really really hard um I am also a weak point of mine is repetition or um kind of organization or structure or like repeating the same day or habits in general mm-hmm not for me. Um, this is why I kind of, when I was younger, I wanted to do surgery because I could, I could not imagine, I recognize this about myself very early on, that I could not imagine having like a desk job or having, um, working a set amount of hours every day or having a similar-ish thing. I can't do it. Can't do it. Not for me. This is why I love medicine. I think, um, that you have an inbuilt, um, kind of randomness and change and of course no two days are the same in any job but there is I think enough variation in randomness in medicine to make it satisfactory for me because I hate um I hate repetition and structure and order um yes structure I don't like I don't like organization and structure it just I find it um yes I find it uninspiring I'm not I'm not good at it I'm not <laughs> I don't thrive in these environments I'm not good at creating structure I'm not good at sticking to structure um I, I I do very much enjoy systems thinking. That's different. So I do love my frameworks when it comes to ways of, oh, this is going to sound so difficult to explain and pointless to explain potentially, but I do enjoy my frameworks when it comes to thinking and my rules, but I don't like rules in real life. Um, so I don't like, I like creating them, but not using them. <laughs> I sound awful. I like creating them, but not using them, if that makes sense. Um, that tends to be my my approach to this. And then the um, the things that I am good at now that I showed the things that I am not good at. Um, I'm good at chaos. I thrive in chaos. Many people get very distressed when they don't know what's going on and what's happening. I love it. I love it. That's where I thrive. I love not knowing what the hell is happening and trying to figure it out. Trying to figure things out is my, one of my ideal states of being. Um, and yeah, I thrive in like embracing the randomness and the weirdness and things changing all the time and trying to adapt. Love it. Um, change. Again, tied into that. I love change. I love working in a fast-paced environment when things are never the same. Absolutely love it. The more chaos, the more change. No, wait, this is probably a bell curve, but I think my bell curve sits more towards the side of change than um, the people that I'm surrounded by, at least. So chaos, change, yes, these are very good. Randomness, again, the same thing. The more random the situation, the more random the job, I think. Um, that's kind of the environment that I thrive in learning and reading. I love this. I love to be challenged. And I think everyone loves this in their core. But um, I, I don't think that there's anyone who doesn't learn how to love. Uh, like doesn't, doesn't love. How to, what? I don't think that there's anyone who doesn't um, love to learn. But I, I, I do. I love to learn. I love to read. If I'm in a position where I very fast realize that I'm not good enough for something. Um, I've discussed this in episode one, why this is potentially very, very toxic. But it's there. Um, it's a characteristic of mine that I just love 
feeling, oh, I know nothing about this and there's so much for me to grow here. Let me find three books and try to um, try to understand these things. So that's very fun. Um, I like early stage things. And what that means is I love the moment of coming up with an idea and trying to make that happen. And I quickly get bored uh, later. So I'm not the execution structure kind of girl. I'm the, whoa, let's make this impossible thing happen kind of girl. And then I might not get so excited by it later. So um, I get, and that kind of ties into, I think, um, the fact that I'm highly, highly, highly passionate. I get very invested in things um, very easily. And work things I think most of the time where I'll go hell yes I love this we're going it we're doing it we're making it happen um I'm the early stage kind of girl um who loves to do that kind of thing and um I love art um mostly because yeah it 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 kind of feeds that passion I think um and I love people I love people and I love communication and I love working with people very often I'm very comfortable working with myself and sometimes I do prefer that but um I think that would be one of the one of the core things that I enjoy too. So thinking of this then, um, I hope you've kind of, these might have prompted a few things on your end. Uh, you might be similar-ish, um, might be very, very different to mine, might be completely opposite to me, in which case, hey, that's really cool. Um, but yeah, I think kind of making that list then helps me kind of, and you can go into granular detail here. You can go into like when you like to wake up in the morning and um, what kind of jobs are you in a job that kind of promotes that and encourages that? Um, or are you in a job that your performance depends on how you, on the things that you're terrible at? And what I mean by that is as a personal assistant, I was evaluated based on my weakness, which is not good. Creativity, not that important for a personal assistant. Of course, important in any job, right? Um, but not as important in a personal assistant. So me, I had this like useless thing where if I created folders or if I got creative with, you know, a calendar booking, not much to do there. Um, while creativity in strategy, much more important. Creativity on YouTube, much more important, although arguably I don't use it much there. Um, creativity in painting, much more important. So I think those are then jobs or roles that are much more suited to me. Um, so I think if you do the same, you can potentially kind of evaluate um, the the job that you've been thinking of having or the roles that you've been thinking of having or the maybe even university degree that you've been thinking of having um, in terms of how does it fit in with these things and does would this job then require that you become excellent at something that you are currently awful at which I think we can all do but would you want to do that um, and is there something potentially easier or more enjoyable for you in between those two things so yeah that was my um, random spiel on this I think it does bring up a few concerns for me in my personal life in terms of the eternal question. Very boring, I guess, for everyone. I, and I just try to avoid it in these podcasts and I try to avoid it in general because I've just, I'm tired of it myself, so I can't imagine other people. But the, the question of is medicine right for me just kind of pops up because it does require that I am, it does require that I am good or that I become better at a lot of my strong weaknesses. And why I do think that we all need to improve our weaknesses, at least to a functioning level. I mean, if you're in a relationship with someone and they had a core weakness that caused you a lot of distress, you wouldn't say like, well, you know, it is what it is, right? Like just, I have these other strengths. No, like you do need to, I think, compensate and you do need to strive to improve on things, especially if they cause distress to other people or distress to yourself. Yes, definitely. Growth mindset, great, lovely. (laughs) Definitely have it, definitely support it. But if, you know, if the something that is a very, very essential core value of someone is something that you find extremely difficult to do, like you would have to bend over backwards consistently to just be able to maintain it at a basic level, is that going to be the most sustainable and healthy thing unless someone changes? Probably not. Um, and the same th- thing case with work, I think. The fact of like the routines that are in medicine, the structure, the systemization and the organization and the um the kind of set pathway into the future and the um the the type of work and the the type of things that I need to learn and the exams and the potentially lack of creativity while there's so many things that obviously I love as in like communication with people and um there's some chaos but there's not it, it, it does require that I improve 
and it does kind of stretch my capabilities to the extreme um, with things such as like memorization and organization and um, sticking to routines and sticking to things like that that I think I've realized now are the reason why I do find it quite challenging in many ways and are the reasons that I don't like so many things in it so yeah I guess that's a decision for me to make at some point um and while I procrastinate from doing that while I paint this um yeah I think oh I think I'm almost done okay I actually want to um to end to end this because then I can start um working on the nose thing so I'll finish this before I end this podcast but yeah I think in that case I would just also recommend that you kind of put a list of values together what are your weaknesses and with weaknesses I know it's a difficult one but maybe thinking of things that what do people find annoying about you because that find that makes it very easy for me to go yeah I know what I'm talking about here like the fact that I'm um, always late to things I think that people find very annoying about me um the fact that I tend to the fact that I tend to very often like double book things or triple book things because I forget um, that what day it is or what time it is, very annoying about me. So I think that organization kind of comes from there. Um, I identified that way. And on the opposite end, the things that you are good at should hopefully be kind of like easy to come by. And that th- those are things that I guess you naturally enjoy. Um, the things that come easier to you than other people, like studying, learning. I was that annoying kid in school that would not study and do well in an exam apparently although I do think that's a bit of a myth but um I was yeah that student that stuff comes easier to me I guess than to other people and that's something that potentially me leaning into that could um lead to perfect (laughs) but yeah um woo I'm kind of done with her face um at least the first stage so ta-da um I now need to do the kind of the nose thing um, and work on that but yeah if you made it so far thank you so much for spending this time with me I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day um, good luck with whatever you choose to do in life and I hope it kind of challenges the things you want challenged and leaves you alone in the ways that you find really frustrating as much as possible but yeah have a wonderful rest of your day be kind to yourself and others and don't believe everything you think thanks bye